Welcome, everyone, to this briefing brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. In Hebrew, our name is Abitronistim. IDSF is the leading Israeli organization advocating for strong national security to defend the state of Israel. Thank you, of course, to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning into this briefing to allow us to bring you really behind the headlines what is happening here in Israel. Uh, there have been major um, changes in this war since our last briefing, namely the direct attack of Iran on Israel, which happened, of course, on Saturday night, early Sunday morning. And uh, to address this issue, we have Brigadier General Amir Avivi, who will share his reactions. Uh, General Avivi was not able to be present right now during our live briefing, and therefore I sat down with the general just a few hours ago uh, so that he could share with you uh, his thoughts on what happened. So give me a second, please, and I will pull up the video recording that we did just a few hours ago. Thank you, General Avivi, for sitting down with me so we can discuss some uh, really important things about Iran. Uh, so to start off with, were you surprised to see a direct attack from Iran to Israel on Saturday night, early Sunday morning? Well, I think that the Iranians made it clear that they are going to retaliate and uh, made a lot of preparations. Um, we knew this is going to be a big attack, uh, but uh, also uh, my assessment was, and I talked about it on national TV, that we're going to be able to deal with this. Uh, we have to take in account that Iran is far away when they shoot. We have a lot of time to spot the shooting and react. Uh, some of the capabilities like drones take like eight hours to reach Israel. And it's time for our Air Force to intercept them. Uh, cruise missiles that take two hours. And uh, the main challenge was the ballistic missiles. Ballistic missiles, they shoot. Um, it goes through space and back. 10 minutes from Iran to, to Israel, and we intercepted all of them. This is an amazing achievement uh, of Arrow 3 and Arrow 2. And uh, even uh, Iron Dome participated in this uh, effort. Uh, I, I can tell you that for decades we have been discussing in the army what will happen when Iran will attack. Really, you know, you, you never know what to expect. But now we know, we know we can cope with this, we can defend, and it means we have a much more freedom of operation to attack and deal with our nuclear program and other capabilities they have. Did we learn anything about Iranian capabilities or Israeli capabilities that we didn't know prior to this attack in defense? Well, 50% of their missiles failed. Either they fell in Iran itself or they fell uh, while uh, flying towards Israel. So out all of these missiles, we only dealt with half of them because uh, many of them failed. This shows you that this Iranian industry is uh, are quite uh, problematic. They're not uh, producing really high quality uh, missiles. Uh, I think that uh, we saw the ability of Israel very, very accurately to uh, coordinate uh, the defense with the US, with Britain, uh, with jo Jordan, Saudi Arabia. We have seen a coalition uh, working together in defense, and we need to see the coalition working together also in offense, uh, attacking Iran and its nuclear sites and uh, other capabilities they have. Now, when it came to the Hamas attack on October 7th, it was the element of surprise that really caught Israel off guard. Whereas here with Iran, there was anything but surprise. There were hours and hours and hours of prep time from the point where they launched their drones. Was that deliberate on Iran's part or just a, the factor of them being so far away? Why not first, for example, send off the ballistic missiles and only give Israel 10 or so minutes to react? Well, the, ready, the readiness of Israel was uh, before they uh, shot. We were monitoring everything they do together with the U.S. We knew all the time what was going on. What are the plans? What are they going to do? When are they going to do it? 
Israel has very good intelligence when it comes to uh, to Iran, and uh, the level of readiness was high already days before, so they couldn't have surprised us in any way. In this sense, um, we were ready, and uh, I'm glad that we managed to intercept 99% of this. Uh, capabilities. And even then, the army says, you know, we did some mistakes, we could have done better. Uh, so definitely, uh, we can do even better than that. Do you think Iran wants to escalate? And this is just the first of many attacks? Or they see this as a one off event? And their their role they see is over? I think Iran made a huge mistake, huge, huge strategic mistake. For six months, Although they're managing everything, funding, directing, all these attacks, they managed to stay behind the scenes and uh, to create a reality where the pressure was moved from them and their proxies to Israel. And now they shifted the world attention to them. For the first time, the world understands what is Iran, what are their capabilities. When Europe sees ballistic missiles shot, thousands of kilometers, they know they're next. Understand what, when we say this ballistic missiles will be nuclear, just a matter of time, now they understand. Uh, so basically, uh, Iran created a reality where Israel gained back support, Israel gained back freedom of occupation, Israel gained the opportunity to push for the coalition with the US and the region. Now the region understands better the need to work together and push a, a normalization with Saudi Arabia and all the Sunni world against this uh, huge uh, threat. Uh, Iran has lost its deterrence because we showed we can deal with this uh, threat. And now Israel is much more important than the, really with the determination to deal with the Iranian their program. Basically, the Iranians set uh, the clock for their, their own destruction. And uh, in this sense, they made a lot of mistakes uh, strategically. And uh, also, you know, we're not happy about the U.S. saying that they don't want to attack Iran. They don't want to be involved in an attack. But the U.S. is saying we're dealing with, we'll deal with this uh, diplomatically. Uh, there are also opportunities in that. Restoring sanctions, not backing from the JCPOA, uh, hurting dramatically Iranian economy. Um, so definitely, uh, there are many uh, real opportunities here. But again, looking at what Israel will do, we need to look at the whole picture. Our first priority is Rafah. We need to destroy Hamas. We need to bring back the hostages. This is priority number one. Priority number two is Hezbollah, pushing them uh, out of South Lebanon and bringing back our citizens home. Priority number three, destroying uh, Iran's nuclear uh, sites and really setting back Iran and their economy uh, and isolating them by building a coalition and the uh, international pressure uh, on Iran. So the U.S. is calling for restrain with regards to the way Israel reacts to Iran. Am I hearing the same thing from you right now? Because you're saying the first priority is Rafa, the second is Hezbollah, and then down the line is Iran? Or I'm misunderstanding that uh, entirely? No, I'm saying that we need to see the full picture. Of course, we have to react. But uh, it makes it much more difficult when the U.S. is reluctant to to do it as a coalition. So we need to get the best of what the US is willing to do at this moment. And this is really restoring sanctions, not backing, backing us up in uh, Rafah, backing us up in, uh, in uh, our operations uh, in the north with uh, Hezbollah. While doing so, Israel needs to decide what kind of response it's going uh, to do in Iran. But if we respond, this needs to be a very, very decisive and strong a response. This uh, attack should matter, should make a difference. It's not just shooting some base or just for the sake of uh, responding. It's not about honor, like the Iranians are acting now, irrationally. No, we need to calculate what we do, and if we do, do it uh, decisively and at the timing 
that suits us. Now, I think that what worries me about the US response and unwillingness to show power is that China is looking at this, Russia is looking at this, and the message globally is that this unwillingness to, to use military uh, force might destabilize the whole globe, might embolden the Chinese uh, in their aspiration to take over Taiwan, might embolden further Russia uh, in their fight in Europe, it will embolden Iran, the Middle East and beyond. And this is a very problematic message the West is sending, it's the wrong message. There, there is no appeasement with a country like Iran. Iran needs to be dealt militarily. And I can say that when I visited Washington uh, last uh, time, I visited the Heritage Foundation and they are really leading the uh, policies uh, the next administration uh, will have uh, if it will be a Republican. And that's saying clearly, Iran must be dealt militarily. We need to destroy their capabilities or get them to understand that military attack is imminent if they don't dismantle all their capabilities. So either way, uh, we need to deal with, uh, with Iran. Uh, there are many ways to do so. One of the things we learned from this attack, Iran is very, very worried about their economy. They kept saying we are not attacking economical sites. We are uh, attacking military bases, basically sending a message: don't attack our oil refineries or oil fields. And this is exactly what we need to attack. We need to destroy their economy. And this is will be done if uh, sanctions are not going to be restored. If uh, there is not going to be a snapback, we'll have to deal with their economical capabilities in a different way. So now that Iran has showed their true colors, it's no longer just a shadow war between Israel and Iran, but at the same time, the U.S. is hesitant to take any further action. So has anything really changed at this point vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. perception of Iran? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the U.S. is a big, big country, and unlike Israel that can change very fast and it's very idle. The US policies take time to change, but I think that what happened here will sink at the end of the, the day. There will be an understanding that Iran is a huge threat to humanity and uh, there will be eventually a change of policy also in the US and I'm optimistic. I think that eventually there will be a coalition and we will deal with Iran. Now, speaking of that coalition, can you just describe a little more detail about the participation with Jordan in what happened on Saturday night and other regional players and, and what that could develop into? So Iran cannot attack Israel without going through Jordan. So basically Jordan defended its uh, uh, airspace and dealt with the threats that crossed to its uh, border. We have to understand that the capabilities of uh, Jordan to deal are Israeli capabilities and American capabilities. They are completely dependent to our, on our own capabilities. They are enjoying Israeli air defense. So uh, they joined uh, with us to deal with these uh, threats in coordination also with other countries. And uh, for many years, we have prepared this ability to coordinate a, a defense against missiles and drones and uh, cruise missiles, and it worked very, very well. And why do you think um, the Houthis and Hezbollah did not take the opportunity to join in the, on the attack on Saturday night? I think that Iran wasn't looking for a full-scale attack because that would mean full-scale war. And they don't are not seeking a full-scale war now. They said it clearly, we attack, we retaliated, that's it, it's over. We all need to look at it as something that is done, over. Uh, but it's not going to happen. It's not over. It's not over. We understand that we need to uh, deal with them. 
they have launched a war against us, not only by shooting directly, but also by launching Hamas, Hezbollah, and the Houthis. And, and the, the way to deal with this is not just dealing with the proxies, it's really cutting the head of the snake. And they are the head of the snake, and their head needs to be cut. Thank you, General, for answering all of these questions. One final question before we go. Uh, what do you think uh, Israelis and the uh, Zionists abroad should be focusing now in terms of their advocacy? Should they be talking about Iran? Should they be talking, focused more on the war with Hamas? Where, what's the emphasis right now and what should we be pushing for? The answer is everything is Iran. Iran has built Hamas built Hezbollah, it built the Houthis in Yemen, the militias in Iraq. Iran is a threat to U.S. national security, is a threat to freedom uh, of, of uh, shipping around the world. It's uh, trying to undermine the U.S. by building capabilities in South America. It's trying to take control of Hormuz, Babel Manda, the Gibraltar strains. Uh, it's trying to push its uh, radical ideology that believes that the world needs to be destroyed completely and they need to rule the day after. This is the ideology. The reason why they are focused uh, on Israel is because this is what's standing between them and global uh, domination. So we, we need to understand everything that's happening is uh, really generated by Iran this huge threat, and in order to deal with this, we need to join together and you know, deal with this. Um, and it needs to be together in a coalition. This is about a threat to the whole Western society, not just uh, Israel, and therefore the whole society needs to fight together uh, to really uh, destroy this uh, huge threat. So much for joining me and for answering all of these questions. That was Brigadier General Amir Avivi in discussion earlier today with his reactions about Iran. And now I'm very pleased to be joined by Mark Zell, the chairman of the Republicans overseas. I had the opportunity to hear Mark earlier today on TV, and I said, wow, I have to, I have to speak. So, Mark, thank you so much for joining. Glad to be here, Moshe. So, Mark, let me ask you a similar question I asked the general. Now that Iran's intentions are clear to the world, it's no longer just a shadow war. Do you think anything will change with regards to the way the U.S. Uh, is dealing with this war here in Israel? No. And the reason I say that, I mean, I heard the general's remarks and I, I agree with virtually everything he said. But I think he's a bit over optimistic about the American and Western reaction. I mean, that reaction you have seen was immediately, and perhaps some people think even before before the Iranian attack, attack was to keep uh, this uh, Iranian attack in uh, under control, that they wouldn't uh, uh, spark a regional uh, uh, war with this attack, and therefore it had to be moderated. Restraint is the word we used, that, that we heard them use. My information Based on the New York Times report is that Israeli jets were already on their way to Iran after the Iranian attack on uh, early Sunday morning, our time, April 14th. Uh, and, and after, as a result of the phone call between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu, those jets were called back. I don't know if that's true or not true, but it does show you the uh, impact of the American position on here. Uh, on on, uh, on uh, Israeli response. It's the same position they've taken with respect to Gaza, with respect to the uh, first the ground war on uh, after October 7th, and then uh, with respect to the invasion of, uh, of Rafah, which is still being delayed. And of course, the, the introduction of uh, super quantities of human humanitarian aid into Gaza. And the same thing happened here with the Iranians. Uh, we were We were told that uh, okay, the United States will will come to your defense. Indeed, America helped shoot down some uh, drones and uh, uh, some ballistic missiles. The Israeli Defense Forces did a, a, a remarkable job in that regard. But nevertheless, the word from Washington was, and from London, and from Paris, and from Brussels, don't retaliate. 
restrain yourselves. And that, uh, Moshe, I think that's a recipe for disaster. On the TV show that you mentioned, I contrasted the two concepts. One is conception, this older preconception that the West has. You can deal with your enemies like, uh, like you can you, uh, with your friends, and you can sit and negotiate with them and reason with them, uh, versus perception, which is how the folks here in the Middle East, Arabs and uh, many Iranians and other groups in the Middle East look at this. You know, we all know in the West what happened on April 14th. Israel scored a remarkable uh, achievement by blocking virtually all of these missiles coming in. Not all of them, but the, the vast majority of them. And that was considered to be a huge accomplishment. And, I, and it is in the eyes of the West. But let, this morning, if you start looking at the, the headlines around the Arab world, it, they say things like, Israel has no immunity. Israel's vulnerable. We, Israel can be beaten. They, they're, they're having celebrations in Iran and the parliaments around the, the Middle East. This tells you something that is completely at odds with how we in the West look at things. And that perception here in the Middle East is a recipe for disaster. Now, when you say recipe for disaster, does that include the U.S.? Does the U.S. become open to attack because of this misconception that they have? Well, the Iranians have already said that, okay? And and I think, if anything, I think Prime Minister Netanyahu has learned this and others have learned this. When, when your enemy says they're going to destroy you or they're going to hit you, you should you should take them seriously. We learned that in World War II and we learned that in other times, okay? But... But the Iranians said, yeah, we're going to go after the Americans and we're going to go after the Jordanians for their betrayal of us. And we're going to go after, after anybody that uh, supported Israel in, in, the, uh, in its defense against Iran, including the United States. I think, I think that you, because of the crisis on the U.S. southern border, the Iranians probably have numerous sleeper cells in the United States. If they wanted to cause trouble, they could do it. They have no compunction about attacking American military targets in Iraq and Syria and the Red Sea through the Houthis and through their proxies in Iraq and Syria uh, and directly. So so uh, the answer to that is, yeah, the, the Americans are are uh, are on the uh, the firing line. Now, I very much connected with your idea of Kissinger 2.0. Are you able to share that with our viewers? Yeah, well, one of the things that happened in the Yom Kippur War in 1973 is Kissinger here, this American uh, uh, Jew in the Nixon administration, decided that it was important from America's strategic uh, uh, interests to let the parties bleed, and that included the Jews in Israel, okay? And so he delayed uh, approving American aid to the Israeli ar armed forces after the Egyptian Syrian attack and let us bleed for a couple of weeks until until he felt that we had suffered enough, gave us the aid, brought brought, a, brought us uh, about, about the counterattack. We then he then put, forced us into a stalemate and got uh, the war over. It was all very cunning. It was all very uh, in my view, uh, very dastardly, you know, a, a kind of real politic taken to an extreme. And he got what he wanted. But that's Kissinger 1-0. On April 14th, we had Kissinger 2.0, when we had the President Biden telling Netanyahu, get those planes back, no more, no more conflict again, they leave the Iranians alone, everything will be okay. You bled. They've, they've been humiliated. Let's put an end to it. That's, that is conception, that preconception idea coming to the fore where we are, uh, uh, we are projecting our own values and our own style of dealing uh, with crisis onto the enemy in this region. That's a terrible, terrible mistake. Mark, I want to zoom out for a second and I very much appreciate you joining me and sharing your expertise. Uh, to what extent do you think that the U.S. has kind of put handcuffs on uh, the prime minister, on the IDF, in terms of all of their operations since October 7th? Well, the, the, you can see that. I can answer that very quickly. Immediately after October 7th, Israel was planning to uh, uh, commence a ground war into Gaza, okay, which is what they should have done. It, because of American resistance, we waited 
close to a month, three weeks, something like that, to do that. And that and that sent a message also to the enemy. The same thing uh, is uh, is it happened here on uh, April fourteenth. The whole the whole world was ready, as uh, Brigadier General uh, Avivi said, for the Iranian attack. The Americans may have had known a lot more about it than they're telling us now, but in any case, we were ready. And we knew, and the Americans knew that if we were hit by the Iranians, that we would, our, our initial and, and, and I think quite logical response, particularly given re the realities of the Middle East, would be to attack back, to retaliate. We started to do that. Biden said, no way. When we said we were going to cut down the uh, humanitarian aid in Gaza and, and because Hamas was stealing it all, they said, no way. You stop that. When we, when we, uh, suggested that um, that uh, we have rights in Judea and Samaria and, and the settlements, our so-called settlements, were, were uh, completely appropriate as the previous administration had determined. The, the Biden administration said, no way, and went to the United Nations and even abstained on a, uh, a very dangerous uh, Security Council resolution to that effect and, and, and breaking all precedent imposed this executive order 14115 on February 1st, attacking our uh, very existence uh, of Jewish uh, uh, of the Jewish people in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, and uh, called upon uh, Israel to uh, take action against them. And they said immediately after, this is Blinken coming right in the middle of the war, saying that immediately after the war is finished in Gaza, that may it, may it come speedily in our days, said that we have to agree to the establishment of Palestinian state run by the likes of these characters in Ramallah. So so if you ask me what the Biden administration has done, there you go in a, in a nutshell. Mark, thank you for sharing all of that. Thank you for joining me for this briefing. I hope we can invite you back uh, to discuss in more detail uh, about uh, that um, bill with regards to the settler violence, so to speak, in Judea and Samaria, but we are completely out of time uh, to discuss that now. Thank you to Thank all of you, our viewers. Thank you for having me on, and, and uh, may I wish all of your, your viewers a, uh, a happy Passover, those of you who celebrate it, and the rest a happy and a week and, and only good tidings uh, for us all. Absolutely, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning in. We'll be back with you tomorrow, 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Israel Time. Until then, stay safe, stay strong. Take care, everyone.